1874, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals took part in the rescue of a small girl named Mary Ellen Wilson from her abusive home. The ASPCA had been founded eight years earlier in 1866 by a wealthy New Yorker named Henry Berg. And though Berg was the president of an organization dedicated to the protection of animals from abuse, he was repeatedly enjoined by citizens who wanted him to intervene on behalf of children. When in 1874, Berg finally heeded this call and helped to remove Mary Ellen Wilson from what contemporaries described as her miserable life. He declared that he was doing so in the name of the girl's rights. According to Jacob Reese, who was then a reporter for the New York Herald, Berg explained his actions by saying, quote, the child is an animal. If there's no justice for it as a human being, it shall at least have the rights of the cur in the street. I think that's probably apocryphal, but I love it so much I always have to include it. <clears throat> Institutionally, animal protection gave rise to child protection, but as I shall try to show here today, animal and child protection were also ideologically linked through a form of what I call sentimental liberalism that tried to reconcile rights with dependence. And as I'll suggest, but which I don't have time to prove to you today, um, I also argue or want to suggest that sentimentalism, sentimental liberalism was tied to the expansion of state power in the supposedly laissez-faire gilded age. The year following the rescue of Wilson, Berg and the ASPCA's lawyer, a man named Elbridge Jerry, formed uh, the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the first SPCC in the world. At the inaugural meeting, Berg and Jerry continued to use terms and imagery derived from liberalism to describe their work. Speaking at the meeting, Berg declared that Mary Ellen's case demonstrated to the world that, quote, children have rights which parents and guardians should respect. Berg linked Mary Ellen's rescue not just to rights for children, but also to a teleology of liberal freedom unfolding in the world. There is a providence in the affairs of men, he declared. The slaves were first freed from bondage, next came the emancipation of the brute creation, and next the emancipation of the little children was about to take place. Linking Mary Ellen's rescue to the cause of the Civil War, Berg implied that just as the end of slavery had secured rights for former slaves, so too the advent of animal and now child protection was ensuring rights for other former dependents. Now, many things about this story, which I've opened with, may strike you as odd. Um, the rescue of a girl by an animal protection organization may seem strange, or the way in which um, animal protection precedes child protection. And um, this story forms the point of origin for my current book project. Uh, but for the purposes of our discussion here today, I want to kind of focus in on one particular strand of the story that stood out for me when I first encountered this um, case and this story many years ago. And that was uh, Henry Berg's choice to frame his actions as a matter of protecting Mary Ellen Wilson's rights. There was not, in 1874, a lot of precedent for discussing the work of what people at that time would have called child saving in this manner. Uh, there was also not a lot of legal precedent for thinking about children as rights bearing beings. By the 1870s, jurists had already made important ch changes in the legal status of children, uh, where once the family had been imagined in patriarchal terms as an indivis indivisible unit represented by the head of the household in the years before the Civil War, American judges increasingly came to imagine the family in what historian Michael Grossberg dubs Republican terms as a collection of distinct individuals, each with his or her own legal interests. So in matters ranging from child custody and adoption to the designation of bastardy, 19th century judges had begun to apply a new rule, the rule of the child's best interests in their decisions. But even though this notion of acting according to the best interests of the child was an important departure from an earlier legal regime, it was not the same as a regime dedicated to or based upon children's rights. And though the uh, interests and rights are conceptually linked to one another, 19th century jurists did not usually make uh, a claim to be acting on or, or be acting in protection of children's rights. Henry Berg, however, did make this claim, and it's this choice, this departure from uh, the language of best interests to the language of rights, 
that caught my attention. As it turns out, Byrd's choice to speak of securing rights for children would become increasingly common among late 19th century and early 20th century child savers. I think that this shift towards children's rights talk is important for what it says not just about the changing status of children, but also for what it says about the changing meaning of key liberal ideas and terms like rights from the Civil War forward. It's my contention that when Henry Berg and others like him applied old terms like rights to new populations like children, they were actually altering the conventional meaning of that former term, of the meaning of, of rights. I can begin to illustrate this point by returning to Berg's teleology, in which he claimed that the emancipation of children followed on the heels of the emancipation of slaves and animals. Uh, we can stop and ask at this point, what is he talking about? Um, <laughs> what does he mean when he refers to the emancipation of animals and children? Though he is equating the former status and the present progress <coughs> of slaves, animals, and children, Berg is also at the same time alighting really important differences between them. For even though he is declaring himself an agent of animal and children's emancipation, Berg does not mean to alter their status as dependents. What Berg wanted for Mary Ellen Wilson was her liberation from a particularly bad and unnatural household, but he did not seek an end to the parent-child relationship, and he did not critique the household or the family as a fundamentally inegalitarian and flawed institution. To the contrary, Berg and others celebrated Mary Ellen's subsequent assimilation into a properly functioning adoptive household, applying that the emancipation he had in mind could take place within the family circle and that rights might therefore be consistent with certain kinds of status inequalities like that between parent and child. So unlike the radical dismantling of the system of slavery that characterized abolitionist versions of emancipation, Berg and others in the post-Civil War anti-cruelty movement sought to reconcile a liberal language of rights with the persistent hierarchies and forms of dependence that characterized human-animal and household or familial relationships.